Good afternoon. Uh, my name is John McCullough and I'm a postdoctoral research associate at University College London. Now I've been asked to deliver this webinar to the POP Centre of Excellence to communicate what the Combiomed Centre of Excellence is doing in the field of addressing biomedical challenges using high performance computing. If you have any questions related to this webinar, please uh, feel free to submit them in the questions uh, questions panel and I'll do my best to address the, um, as many of those as possible at the end of today's talk. So what is ComBiomed? So ComBiomed is a European Commission Horizon 2020 funded centre of excellence that has been funded in two stages. The first ending in the second half of last year and then the second continuing on into 2023. The core partners of ComBiomed combine academic institutions, supercomputing centres and industrial partners and are ultimately led by uh, Professor Peter Coveney at UCL. These partners come from both uh, Europe and the US but are also supported by uh, associate partners in other academic institutions and other research institutions but also in um, various outreach type uh, applications uh, that span the globe, including partners again in Europe and America, but also into the Middle East as well. So what is ComBiomed? So ComBiomed's main reason is the, for the research and the work it conducts is to promote and utilize the, and the development of applications for computational biomedicine. And in particular, those that focus on uh, utilizing and deploying their applications on uh, high performance computing resources. The research applications that are covered by ComBiomed cover three main areas of research being cardiovascular studies, molecular modeling and drug discovery and neuromusculoskeletal analysis. We also have uh, different uh, four research uh, supercomputing centers uh, that are core partners to the project, these being EPCC in the United Kingdom, SURFSAR in the Netherlands, the Barcelona Supercomputing Centre in Spain, and Leibniz Supercomputing Centre in Germany. And these supercomputing centres support the uh, academic and industrial partners by helping to uh, ensure that the codes that we are, and applications that we are developing are able to um, be efficiently deployed on high performance uh, resources, as well as um, looking forward to the next generation of supercomputing uh, capability where exascale performance is something that's going to become um, relevant and become more prevalent. And so this is something that we're developing the codes that we have, but we're also identifying uh, new potential applications from within the computational biomedicine community and um, helping them to take advantage of HPC resources. So I'm going to go through some uh, examples of the uh, research that's been conducted within ComBiomed and how it's uh, how these take advantage of high performance computing resources. So um, I'll say from the outset here, I'm not a I'm not a participant or an expert in all of the topics that are um, covered in the ComBiomed research but I will do my best to answer any questions that you have uh, related to them. However, I will start with the uh, project that I'm working on myself, which is the HEMOB code at University College London. So HEMOB is a 3D lattice Boltzmann code that has been parallelized and optimized to particularly deal with the sparse geometries that are seen in vascular networks. And so what I'm particularly focused on working on is developing a coupled model of full human scale arterial and venous flows. And this is being done using the geometry that you can see in the center of your screen there. Other uh, areas of uh, research that we're doing uh, that are being done at University College London is developing a GPU version of HEMLB to take advantage of the, uh, the number of supercomputers that are uh, offering GPUs and accelerators as a feature in their hardware. So, but the model that we're actually, that I'm actually working with at the moment is uh, a 60 micron resolution of the uh, structure that's in the center of screen. And so this, uh, this model has some 2 billion lattice cells 
the lattice sites spread across the two geometries. And so uh, this is covering the systemic arteries and the systemic veins, which are the red and blue uh, vessels that you can see in the screen in front of you. So whilst this is at uh, a 60 micron resolution and is a large, uh, has a large geometry, uh, ideally being able to generate geometries larger than this would be ideal to get better resolution flow. However, the generating geometries of this size because they are full human scale of geometries is quite a challenging process in terms of memory requirements uh, that is a limitation that I'm currently getting. However, the hemo B code itself, so why is that a good code to be taking forward for um, these large scale studies? And so here I'd like to uh, acknowledge a co collaboration that we have had with our group and the POP uh, Center of Excellence in uh, analyzing and expanding the strong scaling performance of hemo B. And so here, this was done on the SuperMook NG machine, a uh, top 10 supercomputer in Germany. So this, this machine has a, uh, just over 300,000 um, CPU cores av available at full machine level. And so we were able to show this strong scaling performance of HemoB um, on this machine up to full machine level. And so it's important to note here that this study was conducted using a circle of Willis geometry, so which is that a spider-like vascular network you can see on the screen there. And so this is a arterial structure that's located in your brain. And so this geometry that was studied to, to, to perform these tests is not a, a trivial geometry. It is a genuine sparse vascular network. And so HemoB is able to uh, is able to um, show this strong scaling performance using these complex geometries of large size of over 10 billion lattice sites. As we expand the capabilities of HIM within our working environment, we hope to show the strong scale and performance to extend to um, uh, higher core counts as machines become available with, with higher core counts, improve the geometry generation, as I mentioned before, and um, doing our best to ensure that this scaling performance that we can see on a single version of HemoB extends to coupled versions. So we've looked at very large scale flow there, but uh, working confinement is also being done down to small scale studies. And so some work that's being done by the University of Geneva using the Palabos code uh, studies how blood cells move within a vessel and particularly how they interact with each other and, and for example with obstructions that, such as a stent in a, in a vessel. And so Palabos is, a, is another Lattice Boltzmann code that uh, uses Lattice Boltzmann to study the, uh, to resolve the plasma flow moving through a blood vessel. But it is coupled to a finite element method which is used to resolve how the cells that you can see in the, in the, in the image there, how those cells are able to uh, move and deform in response to contacts with the walls, for example, or collisions with each other. So the finite element, the cells are dealt with using GPUs and the fluid flow, which is done by Lars Boltzmann, is, held, is done by CPUs as well as the uh, an immersed boundary method, which is how forces are transferred between the solids and the fluids is also done on the CPU model. So some performance statistics here that the University of Geneva group did. So they've, they did this weak scaling test using uh, their coupled Palabos code. And so this was done on Pierce Daint, which is a, another top 10 worldwide supercomputer that uh, this group has access to. And so they were, they replicated this, um, this geometry that you can see multiple times as they scaled up the GPU count from five GPUs from the reference case study up to 400 of the larger scale model that they investigated. And so what they were able to see with this weak scaling result was ultimately this plateauing of efficiency at higher GPU counts. And so they identify this as the price that they have to pay for the modularity of their code. From their, from their single code base, they're able to, um, to choose to use finite element 
methods or not, they're able to plug it in or, or take it out as their simulation um, needs uh, needs go. And so this same sort of uh, efficiency is seen for different hematocrit. So hematocrit is how many as a measure of how many uh, cells, how many um, red blood cells are in a given volume of of fluid. And so it's kind of, and so the results here are showing that it is somewhat independent of um, of that hematocrit. And so the plateau is kind of a feature of the code itself. So coupling is a um, is an inherent feature of needing to model biomedical flows because there are so many physical and uh, physical features that need to be captured. There's inherently going to be a coupling between different features of code. And the ALIA code, which is maintained by a group at the Barcelona Supercomputing Center and, and used to model heart multiphysics is another example of this. And so here there's two different coupled problems acting simultaneously. There's firstly an electromechanical problem where electro, um, where the, uh, how electrical impulses are moved through the heart uh, are, uh, is, are transmitted and also the solid mechanics of how the heart responds to this electrical impulse and contracts in the form of a heartbeat. So that's the electrical mechanical problem. You also have a, a fluid structure interaction problem where as the heart muscle contracts the, it uh, pushes the blood out through into the into the wider body. And so there's how the fluid interacts with the solid wall is another coupling problem. And so ALIA has both of these mechanics um, in, its, uh, in its solving repertoire. So here are some results that they did a few years ago on the Blue Waters machine in the US on 100,000 cores using a large three and a half billion uh, element heart model for electrophysiology simulation. And so we can see here that up to 65,000 cores thereabouts, they're seeing very good strong scaling results on all different reference measures that they uh, propose. And indeed, when this expands up to 100,000 cores, they see very similar um, uh, strong scalability on particularly one of those and still above 80% for the other two measures. So in the solid and fluid coupling case, we have uh, the results uh, presented here. So in this, this is a much smaller case of only about 110 million elements uh, split between the solid and fluid models. But you know, these results here are not uncoupled, so they're running somewhat independently in that there's, there's not a feedback loop between one side and the other as to uh, how their boundary conditions, for example, or their interaction conditions are, um, are governed. But here, with reference to the lower core count, there's fairly good uh, scaling being seen in both models. And so when we when they introduced the coupling, the coupling between the two uh, two mechanics, as as was highlighted in the Palabos code previously, there is this plateauing of efficiency with um, with the complexity of the coupling that is being enforced. And so as I mentioned with the HEMOB code, and with also these codes, improving this uh, efficiency. Uh, and dividend improving and limiting how much of this plateauing is going on is a, a key computational challenge in dealing with these couple of codes. So moving away from the large scale models, let's look at a uh, some work that's being done by the University of Sheffield, where they're using a uh, light model to identify how two different pathologies in the brain can be can be distinguished. And so in this work, they're looking at two different conditions in the brain. So one is uh, a vasus spasm, and this is where a vessel is basically being squeezed in some way. It's narrowing down. And the other is a stroke, where there is a clot that's formed, it blocks an artery in the brain somehow due to some sort of physical obstruction inside the vessel that blocks a sufficiently small vessel. And so if you're in a clinical setting and you're taking a Doppler measure, which is effectively a um, echo sounding of how the blood is moving through the brain, uh, these two conditions give very similar readings. However, how you treat them is uh, very different. And because neither of these are conditions that you uh, want to let linger, there's something that you need to be able to uh, identify correctly early and then 
uh, treat them appropriately. And so what the Sheffield group did was they first developed a 1D fluid model of brain circulation with 150 input parameters. And so these could include things, for example, um, uh, vessel geometry, uh, in, inlet conditions, the type of uh, condition, so that's a small stroke that they're trying to um, investigate. And so they use this 1D model to train a emulator, so a Gaussian process emulator, which is effectively a lightweight um, uh, equation-based representation of the fluid structure model. And so this, they, this training that they did in a relatively short period of time using their local HPC resources. But from this uh, emulator model, they're able to run a sensitivity analysis. And so they're able to do a large number of sensitiv sensitivity um, studies using a relatively uh, cheap model. And so doing 150,000 emulated simulations is order of um, using the 1D simulation could be order of 450 minutes, 450,000 minutes, for example, uh, a much more costly exercise if this is done using the 1D problem and much cheaper to do in the uh, emulator space. So another key pillar of the research that's being conducted uh, by CompBiomed is in the field of molecular modeling and drug discovery. And so here the idea is to um, identify drugs that or chemical compounds that could be useful in treating disease or treating a, a medical condition and identifying with confidence um, how using computational modeling, how um, how likely these are to participate in the desired chemical reaction, for example, inhibiting a protein. And so this this space is done in two stages. So the first is a docking, docking stage where large numbers of compounds from chemical libraries, which may contain hundreds of millions of compounds, are uh, distilled down into a relatively small number of promising compounds. So uh, there's some work that's been done to use a machine learning generated um, algorithm to identify the best ones of potential candidates uh, from these very large compounds. And so the reason that, and then from these, these promising compounds, more detailed molecular dynamics studies are conducted to identify the most promising of those promising candidates, which could potentially be lead, led to a trial use. Being able to quickly identify useful compounds is, from this large number of potential compounds is uh, particularly use, uh, particularly needed in emergency situations such as the um, the current pandemic situation that everyone is experiencing at the moment. So this is some information from the uh, from a group in America that we're working with uh, on Frontera, which is one of the American supercomputers. And so this is looking at the docking stage, and so identifying roughly the uh, bottleneck of, a, of efficiency that they're seeing with um, with this docking stage. And so the figures here are rough values and they haven't identified the cause of this bottleneck, but uh, this is um, something that they're working towards to start whittling down that large number of potential compound space to identify useful compounds. And so once we have a set of useful compounds, they go to a, um, a molecular dyna dynamic study where a, a large ensemble of tests tests need to be done to gain great confidence on how likely a given reaction is going to take place. And some work with COVID-19 targets that have been done very recently has shown that within 20 hours they can um, study some 300 compounds on the SuperMolecan gene machine that um, I mentioned earlier. So this is uh, some data again from the American group. And here again, they um, are looking at different compounds and how the different complexity of those compounds, so how big those compounds are, as, is affecting the time taken to study them. So in this work, uh, the samples are able to be parallelized and split across onto multiple GPUs because of um, the multiple ensembles are better, better constructed to be able to uh, farm out in that way. But what this graph is showing here is how these different uh, components can be broken down and particularly the blue and green columns, so the actual molecular dynamics and this uh, CBAE step are 
um, almost linearly growing with the complexity of the app of the molecule that they're studying. And so here's a final slide on those results identifying how that training becomes a bigger proportion of the time taken to uh, study that, that process. And as you complete larger ensembles and as you complete larger um, uh, chemical spaces, this, uh, this becomes a significant component is something that they're, they're continuously trying to improve. So finally, briefly on the skeletal analysis side of things, so this is some work that's being done by the universities of Bologna and Sheffield. And so in this model, they're trying to integrate three different uh, components to gain an idea of how uh, drug treatments could improve uh, the risk of hip fractures to pa uh, human patients. And so they combine firstly a, a patient-specific model of risk of hip fracture. So this will take into account things such as um, an individual geometry and also how a pardon me how a potential fall could take place, for example, that could lead to a fracture. They have a, a bone model that looks at how, for example, um, bone densities and uh, strength of bone uh, changes over time. And they have a, a mouse model that's uh, built on how drugs can, um, can evolve and how drugs can affect the strength of bone. And so they're using these three components to feed into each other to um, build this, this model. And so these uh, different components are being spread out onto different local and uh, uh, national level supercomputing systems to uh, do gain insight to how this in silico study can take place in, in order to um, analyze data. And so this includes finite element models, but also image analysis based on uh, individual components. So outside of the research phase, uh, Combinement is also looking at um, how uh, high performance computing outreach can occur, how data analysis can occur, and how um, future applications can be identified. So it's not just a research, um, research center of excellence, it has these other components that are also heavily directed towards high performance computing. And one of these useful uh, useful banners is uh, in teaching. And so in, um, in a clinical setting or an experimental setting, there are, uh, for example, medical students or biosciences students that understand the problems of, um, for example, a clinical setting but don't necessarily, under traditional uh, uh, educational settings, don't necessarily know how high performance computing can assist in answering those problems. Whereas on the computational science side of things of the biomedical problems, there's the computationalists who know how to um, efficiently solve complex problems, but may not necessarily identify with um, which are the actual problems of interest to the clinical or biomedical settings. And so having these, these students that are taught in both fields, both computational and experimental, they're able to bridge the gap between the two, uh, the two groups. And so from its initial work in the initial combined phase at UCL, uh, there was significant success in bringing, um, bringing HPC to uh, as part of the coursework that's done by students in molecular biosciences and medical settings. But another interesting and useful thing is that uh, groups of students that wouldn't necessarily or traditionally um, get into high performance computing are being exposed to it as part of their coursework. And in particular, female and minority ethnic groups are um, seeing a, a greater uptake in these HPC because it's part of their degree now. And so because of the success of this, it's uh, being taken to other combined partner institutions and teaching universities. So data analysis. So another uh, part of the research that's being done by Combined is to uh, evaluate how the current partners are using high performance computing machine learning tools for their data analytics and identifying areas where this can be streamlined and improved and to be done firstly more efficiently, but also to integrate 
uh, components of VBUQ, so validation, verification, uncertainty, quantification. And this is a key step in being able to um, uh, ensure confidence and repeatability of uh, the computational studies that are being undertaken. And so a large number of groups within the consortium are already uh, uh, doing, doing uh, using a high performance tool, but perhaps not necessarily at the current point in time the um, most use, uh, not the, uh, they're not making the greatest advantage of these high performance tools. And so this is something that we're hoping to um, bring forward as part of the, the current phase of Confine. So many of the applications that I've outlined in this, this presentation are uh, continuing uh, in their development. And there's a number of potential applications where the POP Center of Excellence could be engaged to assist in improving the performance of these and making these more efficient on large HPC infrastructures. CompileMed also seeks to identify uh, biomedical applications that may be in academia or in industry that um, haven't at this current point in time necessarily had the exposure to HPC um, expertise and there's potential collaborations between us and POP to uh, better um, enhance the uh, performance of these codes within the wider community. CompBiomed also has a number of webin webinars on topics of high performance computing in computational biomedicine, which are available on the CompBiomed website. So in summary, uh, CompBiomed is a European Commission Horizon 2020 funded center of excellence, has been funded in two phases so far. So the focus of uh, CompBiomed is developing applications and exploiting HPC resources with these applications in the field of computational biomedicine. There are a number of uh, research applications that are covered by CompBiomed in the three main banners of cardiovascular modeling, molecular modeling, and musculoskeletal analysis. And many of these are already operating on uh, high performance computing systems, but there's many avenues where the performance of these could be improved and these provide um, obvious potential collaboration sources between the two uh, centers of excellence of POP and CompBiomed. So finally, I'd just like to say thank you to all the different partners who uh, provide information to this talk. And thank you very much for listening to this webinar. And if you have any questions, can you again uh, contribute those to the question panel and I'll do my best to address those um, now. Thank you very much. Okay. So, um, yes, if you have any questions, uh, yes, please feel free to submit those into the uh, questions tab. Okay, so um, the first question has come through. Uh, you have mentioned a range of applications. Uh, which parallel programming models are more popular in this domain, GPU or MPI or OpenMP? So of the traditional CPU-based codes uh, that I mentioned here, MPI is probably the most popular um, because it allows uh, the large scale supercomputing tools to be conducted. And so, the, for example, the Palabos code, the um, ALIA code, and the HEMLB code that I mentioned at the start of this presentation are all governed, uh, all make use of MPI in those tools. So uh, GPU, so um, the molecular modeling is, um, it makes, it, it takes advantage of GPUs in that the uh, set of ensembles that can be um, that can be studied, they can be they, they can be conducted almost independently. So the it's much easier to farm those out onto a GPU. Uh, however, as I as I mentioned, there's uh, a number of uh, supercomputing centers that could um, that could take advantage of GPU. Oh, there's an, Pardon me. So there's a number of um, applications that could take advantage of GPU in the, a number of future supercomputing uh, machines and indeed supercomputers 
uh, offering accelerators in some form as a um, as a uh, feature. So uh, most traditional codes use CPU and MPI, but GPU is becoming a more common feature. And porting things to GPU um, varies in complexity depending on the task at hand. Uh, second question, um, how has your, my experience been working with Comp for those who may be considering this? So my, my experience was in the strong scaling test of HEMLB and so I found uh, from my interactions that the, um, uh, the POP Center of Excellence is very useful here. So, so the uh, feedback that they provided was clear and informative and was quite useful for me. So I would, um, for those with applications that are, uh, that could have computational performance improved, um, I would certainly recommend it being taken forward. So uh, next question, could I expand a bit more on how HPC has helped, uh, helped you mentioned at the end as part of your mission in terms of engagement as it comes, okay. So Combine Med, uh, how is it helping uh, helping um, uh, bring HPC to other engagement, uh, other parties. So uh, part of Combined outreach is to um, offer to uh, to um, uh, an industrial partner, for example, uh, expertise that could be useful to them. So it's not a uh, at the it's not a um, Pay for service, it is a, a free service that's being funded through the uh, EU grant. So it helps, we have some, we use some of our expertise to identify where um, improvements could be made. And indeed, if it's a more involved, um, improve, um, involved um, uh, task in order to, for example, make it ready for high performance computing, that's where we would uh, provide advice to them and uh, engage them with uh, more relevant centers, for example, the POP webinar, uh, the POP group. So, uh, question says, is there any Navier Stokes solution for blood flow simulations within Confiamed? So, the um, Lattice Boltzmann methods that I uh, discussed before, the Lattice Boltzmann method, without getting into technical details there, um, it uses a mathematical expansion of the Navier-Stokes equations to solve fluid flow. So they are solving those Navier-Stokes equations um, inherently as part of the lattice Boltzmann process. Uh, the ALIA code, it's a finite element code. So it's um, again, solving the, uh, the Navier-Stokes equations across um, uh, elemental volumes. So the ALIA code solves those more directly and the 1D code that I mentioned for the brain model, that would also be solving the um, navier Stokes equation in a bit more direct manner using um, discretization techniques. So those sort of solvers are potential within, um, are, are within confinement at different levels of resolution. Uh, what do I think about the use of AI and deep learning techniques in this domain? Uh, Artificial intelligence is particularly useful, I think, in the molecular modeling space where um, you're distilling down those very large compounds to uh, very large compound spaces in order to identify useful ones that can be done more um, in more in greater detail later on. So uh, in the so in order to distill hundreds of millions of compounds into a uh, manageable subset, that's certainly somewhere where AI is particularly strong in the confinement spaces. And so this kind of leads me on to the next question. Uh, what are your methodologies, best practices to obtain or to digitalize uh, patient specific geometries of blood, blood channels? So any use of machine learning there. So, the geometry that I work with, so that full human one that I presented, that has been generated by one of our associate partners. Um, it is, so a, a Swiss group. And this is a digitization. Originally, it came from a, um, a, a cadaver model that had been sliced up and, and as an image scanning 
process and then the uh, vascular model was generated from that. So I'm not aware of the specific details but in order to the generation of this geometry from those um, from those image subsets is quite possibly a if they're not using machine learning techniques that it would certainly be something in that field that would be um, that would be taken advantage of. So those are the that's the technique that's being generated at the moment. And generally speaking, um, patient-specific geometries they are taken from a MRI scan, for example, as an image process. This is converted to a STL file, which gives us the geometry that we can run blood flow simulations through. Okay, so there are no more questions. Thank you very much again for everyone attending and uh, all the best. Thank you.